In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Well, a good day to you, and thanks for joining me here on another episode of Veracity Hill, where we are striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. It's a pleasure to be with you here yet again, week after week, uh, here. Um, well, I'm, I'm not actually at the uh, Defenders Media offices in West Chicago. I am, uh, um, right now I am here uh, at Crescent Lake Bible Camp where uh, we are um, spending the week on vacation, but I'd figure I'd still uh, come to you, not miss an episode. Um, and Chris, of course, is not with me, so I'm running solo here, and I've got the, the live stream presently going. Uh, the, the stream is looking good, and uh, hopefully uh, everything is uh, going well here online. And so if you are uh, listening live, I want to encourage you to submit your questions, because uh, today is a very special episode. It is the 52nd episode of Veracity Hill, which means we have been coming to you for a full year every Saturday at roughly about 1 p.m. Uh, Central Time. And so uh, this week we've got some questions we're going to be uh, uh, taking, um, either live or some that were already pre-submitted, so we've got a, a lot to get to today. Um, but before I get to the questions, I, there are a couple uh, news items that I wanted to take care of and to handle. Uh, so let me uh, start with that. Uh, the biggest piece of news, I guess, uh, as it pertains to the state of Illinois, is that a budget was actually passed um, by the state government, and uh, it was uh, initially voted upon and passed, but then it was, uh, I should say, it was uh, voted on by the legislature, but vetoed by the governor, Governor uh, Rauner, and uh, however, they overrid uh, his veto. Uh, so uh, the state of Illinois finally has a budget after a couple years. My worry, however, is that it doesn't do enough uh, to meet the demands uh, that are uh, that Illinois has been faced with the debt and the uh, unfunded liabilities. So um, since we're just talking about issues, let me talk briefly about this. So I read an article here, an opinion piece by Eric Zorn from the Chicago Tribune. His column, Is Illinois a Big Spending State? The evidence says no. Uh, well, so, uh, and, and I'll be sure to provide this link uh, at our website uh, after today's show. So basically, um, Zorn here is arguing that when you compare state spending to other states, Illinois is actually not that big of a spender. Here's the problem, though. Uh, if, if we're not spending that much, then we also have a revenue problem because we've taken out debt, loads and loads of debt. And so there clearly is a fundamental problem here of Illinois is having trouble paying its bills. Uh, now, let me also say this. Even if Illinois is not a big spending state yet, that doesn't mean it won't be because of these liabilities, these promises made to numerous people. So for instance, uh, there's a great article here on Forbes uh, uh, by Adam, he's got a difficult last name here, Andrzejewski, uh, mapping the $100,000 plus Illinois teacher pensions costing taxpayers nearly $1 billion. And um, it's fascinating because um, uh, he writes here, it takes the equivalent of all income taxes paid by 330,000 individual Illinois taxpayers to fund the nearly $1 billion for the 7,500 highly compensated six-figure retirees. By any estimation, this is unsustainable. Illinois only has 6.2 million people with jobs. And the problem is this, in the coming years, that number of retirees who will receive pensions in the six figures is going to increase and increase drastically. So this is, this is really a uh, the cliff is coming moment here. And my worry is that the state of Illinois has not done nearly enough to solve the problem, uh, to figure out why, uh, why we can't uh, raise enough revenue or why we simply just can't cut spending on various uh, programs. So, um, so against Eric Zorn's article, I think it's very short-sighted, uh, whether we're a big spending state or not. The state government will become a huge, massive spender in the next couple years. 
And that's not even to point out other forms of taxation, so property taxes, for instance, which are local. Um, that's something that also concerns a lot of Illinois citizens, especially, uh, especially um, uh, sh Chicago land residents in the suburbs where we have uh, higher property taxes. Okay, so that's enough that I'll say about that, um, that f for those that are trying to uh, convince you that Illinois is not in such a bad situation after all, I want to tell you, no, that's not the case. It is in a bad situation. Uh, and it remains so. Uh, this budget does not deal with these long-term problems. So I think the budget that has passed is just another kick of the can down the road. Okay. Um, lastly, another news article that stuck out to me this week was a, um, was a piece in USA Today. Uh, and it's called Born This Way. It's way more complicated than that. And it's an article on human sexuality, uh, specifically homosexuality. And um, I, was, I was taken aback that a uh, main um, media news outlet such as USA Today would uh, publish this piece which talks about how more complicated human sexuality is and even uh, lends some arguments in favor of the traditional view um, because for years now people have been, bar been bombarded with this message that well people that have homosexual attraction are just born that way uh, for example, you've got uh, Lady Gaga had that song, Born That Way, uh, Born This Way, uh, and um, you've got uh, the Born This Way Foundation, uh, and it's just been something that's been touted for the past, oh, well, five, six years or more. The problem is the science doesn't back that up at all. And so it was really surprising to have this USA Today article, which I'll share this at the website if you're interested to check this out and read this article about, about it. Okay, so let me get to uh, your questions here uh, for this Ask Me Anything episode. Um, and uh, I'll mix it in. I've got a couple other announcements, but I want to make sure I get to some of these questions here uh, that were submitted um, throughout the, the past couple weeks, actually, from um, Facebook. Uh, we had an email. We've got some text. We actually got numerous questions from our texting plan. Uh, if you don't uh, subscribe to our texting plan, uh, let me quickly tell you about that. It's really simple. The texts are free. All you have to do is text the word veracity, that's V-E-R-A-C-I-T-Y, to the number 555-888, and uh, you'll get uh, a text every once in a while from me, and it's a way for you to engage with me as well uh, to ask, ask me questions on the show. Uh, any questions, really. I know this show is devoted to asking me anything, but I'm happy to entertain questions of all sorts uh, week after week. So I hope that you'll subscribe to that. All right, so the first question here uh, comes from uh, Seth. And uh, Seth writes here on Facebook. Uh, he says, I'd like to ask Kurt why, uh, ask why Kurt has not embraced the truth of Molinism. <laughs> of course, Seth, the truth of Molinism. There might be a little bit of begging questions, uh, begging the question there uh, when you are assuming the conclusion. Of a, of a contentious point. Uh, now, for those of you unfamiliar with this, Molinism is a, is a camp, is a position, it's a model of how God knows the future. So we're dealing with the issue of divine foreknowledge here. And there are four main camps uh, in divine foreknowledge. The first camp, um, typically in a spectrum, and sometimes spectrums can be uh, designed in certain ways. The first camp uh, is what, what we'll call Calvinism. It's the idea that God knows what will happen because he ordains it, he orchestrates it, he makes it happen. And uh, so uh, that's how God knows these things. Now, the... Uh, the second camp is often Molinism, uh, but let me save that until the end uh, to get to your point, uh, Seth. Uh, the, so the third camp is typically called Arminianism, and it's the position that um, that God knows all things, specifically all future things. But Arminians sometimes don't provide a model for how that's the case. They want to affirm, they think the scripture uh, supports the notion that God does know all things, but may not provide a model for how that's the case. Some of them do. 
Some Arminians do. Uh, so one who is um, uh, written on God and time and divine foreknowledge. His name is Kevin Timpey, uh, and he's currently at, uh, I believe, Calvin College now. Um, and if you uh, search Google for him, Kevin Timpey, T-I-M-P-E, you'll come to his website where he's got various articles for how God can know the whole future. The fourth camp uh, is called Open Theism. And Open Theism uh, has a number of sub-camps because some of the Open Theists disagree on exactly how this is the case. But basically, it's the idea that God does not know at least some future truths. Now, some Open Theists say that he can't. Uh, some just simply say that he chooses not to uh, or that there just aren't future truths to be known. And so actually those are the three subcamps there if you're following along with me. Uh, yeah, but So that's open theism, that God does not know some future truths. Now, let's get back to Molinism and to Seth's question. Um, Molinism is the idea that God knows all possible truths. And some of uh, what's possible is not... Uh, some of what is logically possible just isn't feasible. Uh, it, it wouldn't work out according to God's purposes. So God has sort of feasible worlds from which he can choose to actualize. God has feasible worlds from which he chooses to create. He picks one and says, I'm going to create this one. And that's the world that we live in. Okay, So that middle knowledge is his knowledge of those feasible worlds. And uh, so that's essentially what Molinism is, uh, pertaining to God's middle knowledge of his divine foreknowledge. So the way that God knows what will happen is because, well, he's actually decided which world he will actualize. Now, for many, this helps bridge the gap between sort of uh, a Calvinistic view of divine sovereignty with a robust understanding of libertarian free will which you often see it in the Arminian camps. So many uh, like to embrace this position on divine foreknowledge called Molinism. So why have I not embraced uh, the uh, supposed truth of uh, Molinism? <laughs> well, I have a number of concerns. One of the most famous objections is called the grounding objection. Uh, that is to say, how would God know what I would do if I were offered uh, chocolate or vanilla? Uh, what, what makes that thing true? Um, so that's the grounding objection. My main concern, honestly, is this. Uh, and uh, I am concerned that Molinism doesn't do enough to, uh, to salvage or retain libertarian free will. Uh, now, I'm not a philosopher. I did my undergrad in philosophy, but I haven't done any graduate work. Uh, my graduate work has been in theology, so... I know I'm getting into philosophy of religion here, which I do enjoy talking about and thinking about. But let me, let me explain it this way. If God sort of has a logical step where he's evaluating these feasible worlds from which he wishes to actualize only one, the world we live in, then God has uh, the, the choice uh, to bring about a world where I choose chocolate or to bring about a world where I choose vanilla. Uh, if, if I'm presented with two ice cream choices. And uh, the question remains, how would I be free if God still has that choice to pick one feasible world or another? Now, this objection has been raised, believe it or not, by a Calvinist uh, named uh, James Anderson. I think it's James N. Anderson. Uh, and I will provide the link uh, that explains this uh, concern against Molinism. Uh, so I just... In a nutshell, I find Molinism to be too deterministic. Uh, I don't think it can salvage uh, libertarian free will. So I personally embrace the, uh, the Arminian um, camp uh, that I believe God does know all things. But a model for how that's the case, I, I think divine foreknowledge can be quite um, mysterious. Um, and let me say this too. Uh, theology is a pick-your-poison game. Whichever camp you want to affirm on any on most any issues there are going to be shortcomings 
There are going to be difficulties. There are going to be some quandaries or even biblical passages that need to be uh, reconciled. And sometimes you want to pick the camp that you think has the least amount of difficulties, but you still have to reconcile some things. So, as it presently stands, and I'm open to changing my mind on this, as it presently stands, I am comfortable with affirming the uh, Arminian position on divine foreknowledge. Um, and uh, I'm open to um, uh, exploring how God knows those things. But I find that the Calvinist, Molinist, and even open theist models uh, don't quite match up with how I interpret scripture or a number of theological um, positions I hold. Uh, so our, our ideas and beliefs are kind of like a web, uh, and they, uh, they intertwine and touch with each other, and they affect how we uh, think about, say, God and time. That's one of the issues very closely related to divine foreknowledge. Uh, so um, that's, uh, you know, just something we need to be careful of. Um, so uh, we've got a, a question here already in. Uh, can you amplify on the definition of middle knowledge? Uh, so... Um, Yes, middle knowledge refers to God's knowledge of these feasible worlds. Uh, now, God has knowledge of all possible worlds. Uh, and he also has knowledge, of course, of the, the, the actual world. And so uh, this, this worldview, this philosophy, uh, came from Louis de Molina, who was a, uh, a Jesuit theologian, a Catholic theologian, back in the 16th century. And um, I, I, I know this a little bit because of my, <laughs> my work studying the semi-Pelagians, because part of these uh, Catholic debates, some of them were called semi-Pelagians. And so it's interesting that um, these debates get into my, my research there. Okay, so um, middle knowledge is a logical step between God's natural knowledge of all um, possible worlds. Um, and his free knowledge, which is the knowledge that he has of this actual world. So there's this sort of middle step. It's not a chronological step. Uh, philosophers call it sort of a logical step because God's not sort of thinking here in chronological time, if you will. At any rate, so he has this middle knowledge of these feasible worlds because perhaps it's the case that possible worlds um, not all of them he can actualize. Say maybe maybe there's a possible world where only um, uh, where Adam and Eve don't sin, um, uh, and God wants to create a world where there's no sin. Well, then there's only two humans, because uh, say you know if there were further humans, uh, then they would sin. So if God wanted a world where there were no sin, maybe um, you know maybe there'd only be a couple humans. So the problem with that, of course, is, well, maybe God just wants a maximal amount of people to be in relationship with him, not for there to be a world with, um, uh, not, not for there to be a world where there's ever no sin. Of course, God is still working now to bring about a world with no sin. Um, okay, so um, I've got to move along here, um, and maybe I'm already getting the impression that I'll go over my hour time slot today because we've got a lot of questions here. Um, so um, thank you for your question, Seth. I, I do appreciate that. Uh, let me move over to the texting here because we had a number of people submit questions uh, to uh, the texting here. Uh, all right, we've got number uh, texter 2265. Uh, texter 2265 asks this, uh, what has been your most interesting discovery in your study of the doctrine of original sin? Uh, that's, that's a good question and thank you for that uh, question because I haven't yet talked too much about my research on the show. Uh, that's been intentional because I'm still working on my dissertation and um, you know once I finish I'll probably speak more about it. But um, let, me, let me say this. I would say my most interesting discovery, so for those of you who don't know, I study uh, the so-called semi-Pelagians. These are monks from the 5th century. Uh, southern France, uh, John Cashin, Vincent of Lorenz, and Faustus of Reeds are three fellows that I'm looking at. Uh, and let me say this, that um, for Vincent, I was a bit surprised uh, because it seems that there is one place where he talks about the inheritance of guilt. And so I was a little bit surprised about that. Um, so maybe that was the most interesting discovery uh, in my study. Another, another aspect I'd say is this, 
uh, most Reformed theologians have never read the Semi-Pelagians. They've never read the primary sources. Uh, they have uh, either uh, simply taken their view from Augustine's writings uh, and interpreted them uh, and have formed that view. And I say that as someone who has read the primary sources and as someone who has read secondary uh, and then even tertiary, if these Reformed theologians would be tertiary sources, I see how they misunderstand these guys. And so that's also interesting because to this day we have people that are adamant that those guys believe one thing, but really they haven't even read the primary sources to check on it themselves. So that's the other thing. So thank you, Texter2265, uh, for that question. All right, back over to um, Facebook here. Um, we've got a couple that are coming in live here, so I hope I can get to those here. Here's uh, Kyle's got a question. Uh, he asks, after 52 episodes of varying controversial subjects, <laughs> How do you draw the line as a host between allowing space for a guest with a differing opinion than you talk to uh, than you to talk freely and inform your listeners when to speak up and make distinctions? Um, so I think I think I'm getting the, the gist there of your question, Kyle. Uh, there have been times where I do let um, some folks continue on, even when I disagree with them. Uh, I remember, um, uh, let's see if I could think of one. I remember. Uh, Gary DeMar, I remember, came on, and I think I was sick that day, too, so I didn't want to do too much talking. Um, and he was very heady as well. He had a lot of Bible passages memorized uh, for that discussion, that topic. And it was an area I hadn't really studied. And so I was just going to let him talk. The combination of me being a little bit sick and me not having studied that area all that much, you know, so he's obviously more well-versed. But I was going to let him just talk a little bit more um, than, than normal, I would say. Uh, and sometimes, uh, some of the guests, they just, you know, they're providing a lot of good stuff. I remember Paul Copan, uh, if I asked him a question, he could go for, you know, five or six minutes. But I liked what I was hearing, and so I just wanted to keep him going. Um, not only because I liked what I was hearing, but because I want the audience to hear those things too. Uh, and, you know, when someone is very well versed in that, uh, in an area, you know, when they're an expert, uh, it's nice to listen to experts. Um, so, uh, so yeah, maybe that answers your question. Um, you know, there was, I remember I had one time a caller, um, he was, uh, he was pretty passionate and I think I had to cut him off. Maybe, in fact, I remember my wife said that I should have cut that guy off earlier. <laughs> uh, so that would be a, that would be a, um, a caller, not so much a guest, but there haven't been too many times where I've cut people off. Um, and hopefully, you know, if there's, uh, times you think I should cut off someone sooner rather than later, Feel free to let me know. <laughs> okay, uh, also here on Facebook, uh, we've got uh, Phil. He's got a question here. Uh, he writes, I'm super confused with Islam, where one side promotes peace, uh, the other likes to, quote, kill the infidel. There's plenty of Christian knuckleheads and different sects out there that abuse scripture for personal gain or only use Old Testament as their justification. Is there a better clarification on that stance? And how would you deal with Christians and non-Christians who infuse their rhetoric, uh, ranting against Muslims, generalizing terrorist at, um, attacks uh, to the community as a whole, uh, terrorist acts uh, to the community as a whole? Great question, Phil. Okay, so how do we understand Islam, and why are there different interpretations here? Uh, so I am going to, uh, I, I've in the past staked my claim here, and this is the way I understand it. Historically, if you understand the history of Islam, it is a uh, joint relationship between the state government and the religion. And the goal of Islam is to make everyone on planet Earth a Muslim. Hey, same goal with Christianity, right? We want to make everyone a Christian. There's a key difference between Christianity and Islam, though. It's that there are numerous passages in the Quran that talk about subjecting the infidel uh, ultimately to death if they won't repent and if they won't pay the, a, a tax. Um, Islamic law allows for a tax to be paid for a Christian to uh, continue doing what they're doing. Uh, so if you don't pay the tax, and, if you, and especially if you don't submit, well then, uh, that's punishable by death. Okay. What about these terrorists that are 
performing sort of guerrilla warfare. Well, they interpret these kill the infidel passages and they go kill the infidels. However, I don't think that they have the right interpretation of, of the Quran. The way I understand the Quran, uh, before I get to that, let me explain this. So the reason why terrorists attack uh, other Western nations uh, is because we are what they consider Dar uh, el Harb. Uh, and Dar el Harb um, in Islamic theology is a house of darkness or a territory of war because we do not have Sharia law uh, ruling in the land. And so uh, the ultimate go goal is to make uh, a Dar el Islam or a house of submission. Uh, and because we are a Dar el Harb, terrorists think we need to attack them. But I think this sort of guerrilla warfare is not uh, historically accurate as it pertains to Islamic theology. I think traditional historic Islamic theology has held to a traditional warfare model against Dar el Harb. And this is why for over a century, uh, sorry, not over a century, forgive me, over a millennium, Islam attacked non-Islamic countries. So that's how I understand jihad in a traditional warfare sense. And this is a question that I have posed to a number of Islamic apologists. Uh, people who, uh, Muslims who defend Islam and, and correctly ward off against the American rhetoric against jihad as terrorist attacks. I think their response to that is um, good, but it's insufficient because ultimately America is a Dar el Harb and I'm wondering uh, why, why it is uh, that they can't respond to my objection here that the, the armies of Islam should rise up and attack America. I, they, they have given insufficient um, reasons to this and they know, that they know, I think they know historically that's the reality. Now others who are a bit more modern, a bit more Western, they now interpret the Quran differently than it had been interpreted. And I'm talking just a couple centuries here uh, of difference. Um, so, all right, let me move along um, because we're already at 27 minutes here uh, in today's show. Uh, so this is great. I want to thank everyone for their questions ahead of time here, especially ahead of time because then I can see. But I know I've got some people here uh, also um, asking live here. So let me get to another one of those here. Um, Michaela asks, if you could have any living guest on the show in the next year, who would you want it to be? Uh, well, I've already had Oz Guinness on the show. Uh, I'm a big Oz Guinness fan and um, appreciate all of the work that he has done. Uh, I have... Uh, I, I'm pretty sure I said this on the show when he was a guest. He is America's prophet. He is Alexis de Tocqueville today. And uh, I think more people need to pay attention to him. And Alexis de Tocqueville was a foreigner. He came and visited the U.S. He made uh, observations. He was a social scientist and uh, made very astute remarks about the American experiment, about our democracy. In the same way, Oz is a foreigner uh, originally. And he's a social scientist uh, making observations, and I think people need to listen to him. So I've actually made the decision, I mean, I've, I've read some of his books. I made the decision um, after I finished my PhD work. The first things I'm going to read are, uh, are Oz Guinness's books, every one of them. Uh, so I've already read a couple, but I'm going to go back into history and, and read uh, other things that he said as well. Uh, okay, so but a living guest that maybe I haven't had on the show yet, um, I would say... Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, I'd like to get like a politician, like a U.S. senator uh, on the show. I think that'd be a lot of fun uh, to get someone uh, in government that high up. So that's something to aspire to, if I could get a politician on the show. Uh, so, M Michaela, thanks for your question there. All right, um, and then um, let me take one more question before heading to a break here. So, uh, a texter here. Uh, asks, uh, this is 9853, uh, texting in. By the way, if you want to text in your questions, uh, just text the word veracity to 555-888. Um, 
and uh, let's see here. Okay, let me load up the question. And it is, what is the axiom of Christianity? Okay, what is the axiom of Christianity? Uh, so, what is what is the what is the main proposition? What is the essence of Christianity? Um, and I would say. So one of my favorite Christmas carols is Hark the Herald Angels Sing. And that song, those lyrics, really talk about the, uh, the Christian message. Um, so maybe, maybe if I'll, I'll give you a brief rendition here, and forgive me if I uh, miss a note. <clears throat> Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Joyful all ye nations rise, join the triumph of the skies. With the angelic host proclaim, Christ is born in Bethlehem. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. And uh, further lyrics talk about uh, uh, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, uh, hail the incarnate deity, peace on, uh, uh, later on, let's see, uh, um, uh, peace on earth, uh, let's see, uh, well, sorry, peace on earth, mercy mild, let's see, uh, pleased as man, pleased as man with men to dwell, uh, Jesus our Emmanuel. Here, I just got the lyrics up now. Um, and also in the, the following, uh, the last verse, um, uh, hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings, risen with healing in His wings. Now He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die. Uh, so there's, um, what is the axiom of Christianity? I would say it's there in, in Hark the Herald uh, Angels Sing. And uh, uh, one of the distinctive features to uh, Christianity is the Trinity. Uh, it is the, uh, the, the three persons being um, revealed over time. Uh, three persons, one essence, uh, and um, perhaps that's something that isn't so much um, uh, talked about in this in this Christmas hymn. Um, but otherwise, "Hark the Herald Angels Sing" I think is um, a really great song to get across the message, the axiom of Christianity. It's that God has come to us to save us, and that's the good news. Uh, and so. Um, you know, that's what I'd say is the axiom of, of Christianity. Uh, so thank you for that question, 9859. Um, all right, well, we've got to take a break here, uh, but otherwise we've got other questions, and I see other people tuning in here, so thanks for those questions. And uh, and I know those following the live stream, you're not going to be able to hear the break because I've, I've got the makeshift studio here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp uh, in the Northwoods of Wisconsin. Uh, so now stick with me, with me through the short break from our sponsors. To Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Hello, I'm David Smith, the Executive Director of Illinois Family Institute, a state based Christian pro life and pro family public policy organization. I want to invite you to join us as we seek to be salt and light to a dark and rapidly decaying culture. You can do that in a number of ways. For example, you can join our email list to get timely alerts and great cultural commentaries. You can like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter, listen to our podcasts, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You can attend one or more of the special events and forums we host in different parts of the state. We do all these things to encourage and equip Christians in Illinois. You see, we need you to help us fulfill our mission to boldly bring a biblical perspective to public policy. Our faith requires us to be bold, speak truthfully, and love our neighbors. Join us. Visit IllinoisFamily.org to learn more. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. 
At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. Alright, thanks for sticking with us through that short break from our sponsors. Uh, today we are doing the 52nd episode here of Racity Hill. We've been coming to you uh, for a full year now, week after week, 1 p.m. Central Time, and uh, you know, bringing you fresh content about uh, uh, things happening in the news, uh, theological issues we should be thinking about, but also um, you know, political and economic issues. Uh, and this was something I wanted to do with the podcast because uh, not many Christian uh, ministries uh, get into the political and economic issues. Uh, I'm not sure why it is. Perhaps um, they don't want to alienate potential um, uh, followers, maybe, uh, or even donors. Maybe they believe, and I hope this is not the case, maybe they even believe that um, there's not much to be said by way of Christian theology there. And the, way I, and the reason why I hope they don't think that is because uh, all truth is God's truth, all right? And if we can discover political truths, such as men having inalienable rights, then that means a, a form of government should flow from that and protect those rights. And uh, regarding economic truths, if we can empirically uh, verify and study, say, minimum wage law and see the effects then we can see that minimum wage has uh, counterintuitive uh, effects and how it doesn't really help those that need it most. So we shouldn't do that, those things. So these are sorts of truths, even ethical truths, right, in economics uh, that exist. And that's why um, I, I wanted the podcast to touch on those topics. And we've done a number of political and economic uh, themed uh, episodes uh, throughout the course of this year. Uh, which reminds me, look, if you've got something you want me to talk about or you have a guest that you want to come on, uh, please let me know. I'd love to get your feedback. There are numerous ways to get in touch with me. Uh, while we don't have the call-in system going today, uh, you can call any time. The number is 505-2STRIVE. That's 505-278-7483. Uh, please leave me a message. I'd love to hear it. Um, and let me know if you want that to be played on the show as well. Uh, you can also email me, Kurt, at veracityhill.com, or join the texting plan, uh, text word veracity to 555-888. Okay, let me get back to your questions here. Uh, we've got numerous ones here now coming online. Uh, thank you for those that are following the live stream. Uh, we've got uh, James here. So he has asked, um, he says, do I have to attend a church to be a Christian? I work and have no time to attend church on Sundays due to my schedule, but my faith remains strong. James, well, hey, uh, thanks for commenting and, and for, for following along here, and glad to see that you are remaining strong in the faith. But I do want to encourage you to find a place of fellowship. It doesn't have to be Sunday morning. It could be on a Saturday night. I know a lot of churches, they do a Saturday night service. But think about the early church. You know, the early church didn't necessarily meet in these big buildings. Um, and they didn't have organs with huge choirs. They met in home churches. And so what is the Christian community about? Well, it's about fellowship. Uh, not only is it about worshiping the Lord, which is what the early church did do, uh, but it's about fellowship with other believers where you can be encouraged, where you can uh, confess your sins to one another, Galatians tells us. Uh, so I think, uh, and Paul also uh, tells the church to not give up, uh, not not to give up on meeting with each other. So I do think that um, a, a regularly scheduled gathering is very important to the Christian lifestyle. Uh, but it doesn't have to be in a, uh, doesn't have to be in a, a church building. It could be, I know some churches, when they're, they're new, they meet in movie theaters or people's homes. Uh, my, my wife, uh, for a portion of her upbringing, was part of a home church. And so people would come over to her house on Sundays um, and that's where they would do church. So I would still encourage you to do church with people for all of the great benefits that come from that. Um, so yes, I hope that answers your question, and I hope you can fit it into your busy schedule. Um, I think, you know, 
try your best to just get an hour to two hours out of your week available where you can do that. Um, and and I, hope, I hope you can do that well and have that uh, accommodated, say, with your work schedule. Thanks for your comment there. All right, let me take another from the text in here. We've got someone, what is the best book to read to learn how to refute Calvinism? <laughs> okay, here's your cheesy answer. You ready? The cheesy answer is the Bible. <laughs> I, I couldn't stand, you know, uh, there are so many times when I've had these discussions and, you know, say the, uh, someone would say, well, how do I know Calvinism is true? Oh, we'll just read the Bible, you know. Uh, that's the cheesy answer. Okay, the real answer is, uh, it depends on what level you're looking for. Uh, for, a, for a book to refute Calvinism, if you want heavy-duty stuff, I've, I've got some books where I can, uh, you know, you're going to be going deep into Bible backgrounds, you're going to be going deep into theology and philosophy. Uh, but otherwise, if you're looking for sort of a starter, um, I would recommend um, a, a book that we actually did an episode on. So the book is called The Potter's Promise, A Biblical Defense of Traditional Soteriology by Leighton Flowers. He is a former Calvinist, and for many years was a Calvinist, until he, it sort of clicked for him. What was it that clicked? Well, he realized um, that Romans 9 is not about individual predestination for eternal salvation. And when that clicked for him, it really opened his eyes to what the historical context was pertaining to Jewish-Gentile relationship. And that relationship is also seen in Ephesians 1, which is another big passage on election. So um, I would recommend The Potter's Promise uh, to check out. You can get it on Amazon um, for you know, probably 10, 12 bucks, something like that. Very good book if you're sort of looking for that starter starter book. Okay, uh, moving along here, uh, Michael asks, uh, what are Kurt's top five Christian influences that shaped his views? That is a tough one, actually. Um, I would say, you know, when I was in high school, I uh, really started to, to read and soak up Ravi Zacharias uh, when I was beginning to ask the deep questions of life. So I'm really blessed to have discovered uh, him and his ministry. So I would say Ravi Zacharias is one. I would say William Lane Craig is second. When I got to college, I sort of advanced from that pop apologetics to studying these issues in a deeper way. And Dr. Craig is very philosophical. He is a genius. Uh, he is uh, he's also very hardworking. Uh, and so I would say that he was also another influence to me um, because he really showed me, wow, you can really be a, a smart Christian and really know your stuff and take on other philosophers. Um, so this isn't, this isn't something that we should shy away from uh, as Christians, philosophy that is. Uh, philosophy is good uh, and it helps us to think constructively and critically about things. It teaches us how to think. And so when we know how to think, we can go into a number of different fields and begin learning and evaluate certain claims because we know how to think well. Uh, so I'd say Dr. Craig is the second one. Uh, that leaves me three more. Ugh. Um, okay, I would say, let me say um, vocationally. Uh, vocationally, I have liked uh, Jay Richards, who's another Christian apologist. Um, he's a Catholic uh, fellow, uh, while I'm not Catholic, but vocationally, I liked who Jay was because of his mastery of different fields. Uh, including economics. He's written a book, um, Money, Greed, and God, Why Capitalism is the Solution and Not the Problem, uh, but also traditional uh, Christian apologetic areas uh, in natural theology. And I, I just like, you know, it was the first time I realized, oh, who this guy was, that he wrote books, he went around speaking and debating. So I'd say Jay Richards was sort of a vocational influence uh, for me. Uh, so that's three. Uh, maybe I'll leave it at three for now, Michael. Uh, so I can get to some other questions, but, but thank you uh, uh, for that. Okay, um, let me get to some other ones here. Uh, Kyle has a quick question here. Uh, have you figured out your new NBA team yet? I have not. So for those that are following along, uh, I've been a Bulls fan my whole life. Uh, when you grow up watching Michael Jordan, how do you not be a Bulls fan? Okay, and so I was a Bulls fan, um, and but... It, it began, the Bulls began to sour on me, uh, believe it or not, during the Derrick Rose era. And this is something that I can give you the sources for. 
after Derrick Rose won the MVP, I began to tell my friends that I thought the Bulls should trade him. Um, there was something about him. Maybe it was just while he was a really good basketball player, he didn't have a, a lot of um, smarts or intellect. <laughs> Uh, I remember. Remember, he did cheat on the uh, the SAT. He had someone else take it for him. <laughs> uh, at any rate, um, so I thought they should trade him and get some value for him, and they didn't. And look what happened: the injury. I said, trade him. Injury again after they re-signed him. So they just they they didn't know what they were doing. Um, and these past few years, they've just been floundering. Um, they tried to sort of go all in last year, which was nuts because they couldn't do it. So I, I've been getting tired of sort of these eighth seed finishes. Um, at any rate, Gar packs, they don't know what they're doing. So no, I haven't figured out a new NBA team yet. I'm leaning towards a couple teams though, thinking about it. Um, so we'll, we'll see. So thanks for that. Okay, um, Robert writes here, Kurt started following you while in seminary as I listened to uh, the ADC radio show. That's apologetics.com. Uh, here's a question he's got. Uh, why do most media outlets lean left? Uh, is it a reflection of the people watching and based solely on ratings? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, some of it can be um, just staff and employees, which way they lean. And um, not even necessarily the reporters, but the higher-ups as well. Uh, and, it, you know, I know CNN has been in the news a lot recently uh, because of numerous uh, false reports and heavily, heavily biased uh, reports as well. Uh, New York Times just had something recently where they uh, took it to Trump. Trump tweeted that China and North Korea, something, they increased their trade agreement for almost 40%, something like that. And the New York Times took it to Trump because the precise figure was 37.5, and they didn't know where Trump got that 40% from. And Trump tweeted almost 40%. So you can see here that they're, they're clearly out to get him. Um, yeah, and that's, you know, really a shame because uh, they're being uncharitable. Uh, and, and even in that case, just inaccurate. Um, so, yeah, I'm not sure it would be a reflection of people watching. Um, I, I think, believe it or not, uh, if the media, um, if the mainstream media weren't as popular, I think more people would be conservative. So I don't think it's necessarily uh, that they, they're trying to tailor it to their audience. Um, but that's a good question. I, I'm not sure I've thought um, as much about that. Um, Oh, Michael writes here, Oz Guinness better make the top five. Yeah, yeah, in terms of a political observer, uh, yeah, he's definitely uh, been an influence uh, for me. And even on apologetic methodology. I like Oz a lot on apologetic methodology. Uh, but I figured I'd already talked about Oz. And everyone, look, all you have to do is go listen to the Oz Guinness episode. You can hear my fanboy uh, uh, mentality come out. <laughs> Okay, um, so we've got some other questions here. Uh, let me see what I've, what I've missed or haven't missed here. Um, other than the Bible, uh, what is one book every Christian should read? Other than the Bible, what's one book other, uh, every Christian should read? I'd say Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Uh, I think Lewis had a profound impact upon evangelicals, especially American evangelicals, uh, which is fascinating because... Uh, American evangelicals of 50 years ago, 60 years ago, didn't share the same um, pious attitude toward, say, drinking and smoking as Lewis. Uh, but Alistair McGrath calls Lewis the, the patron saint of American evangelicalism because Lewis had a way of explaining theological concepts to the masses uh, that, that appealed to average Joes. So I would say Mere Christianity is the book that every Christian should read next to the Bible. So thank you uh, for that um, texter. Okay, um, we've got some other questions here. Um, here's a question. Was it surprising, and this is someone that uh, has obviously done their homework, uh, was it surprising to you to discover that a faulty Latin translation of Romans 5.12 led Augustine and others to embrace the concept of original sin? Um, uh, that is the belief that every natural conceived human is personally guilty in the womb of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden. Um, so this is something that I learned um, years and years ago, not even in my doctoral work. Um, so I'm not sure what it meant by surprising. I think what was surprising to me about this is that this mistranslation wasn't discovered until the Reformation era. So for a, uh, for a millennium, uh, 
Christian thinkers and theologians were in the West were reading a poor and incorrect translation of Romans 5.12. What's even more ironic is that Pelagius' interpretation is actually the correct one that we take today. And that's the one that uh, all the translations have, uh, well, not all, most have fixed. Um, so um, was I surprised to discover that? Uh, I'm not sure if surprise is the right term, but, um, but yeah, so thank you for that question. Now let me say this, I have recognized that Reformed thinkers will still try to salvage their doctrine out of Romans 5.12 and in another place in 1 Corinthians where uh, uh, Paul also does the Christ-Adam uh, comparison. Uh, I think it becomes stretched though, and I think it becomes really stretched in Romans 5 when you continue to read the passage woodenly because Paul talks about how um, uh, just as uh, one man brought death to all men, so one, one man brings life to all men. And I'm pretty sure Reformed folks are not universalists. So if they're going to read the text woodenly in that way, in a strict way, then I think they've got problems for consistency's sake. I interpret the passage loosely. Paul is making a loose comparison between the way of Adam and the way of Christ, the first Adam and the second Adam. And so I, I don't find my interpretation encountering those difficulties. Uh, so that's why, for example, I'm not a universalist, uh, but I, I know what Paul means there. Um, so, okay, um, moving along, let me check the time too. 51 minutes. This is flying by. Uh, again, thanks for those that have uh, submitted questions. I appreciate it. And, and for those that are watching, uh, thanks for, for tuning in. Uh, let me get here. Um, Phil had another question here. Uh, he writes, let's see. Um, he recently saw a post about what Jesus, during his ministry, would really say toward uh, gays or transgenders. Now, I, I don't like the term gays. I would say people who have homosexual attraction. Because when we get to the heart of the matter, because that's really what it is, it's a person, and it's a person who has an attraction towards someone of the same sex. Um, what that does, it helps to separate the identity. Because for people, for many people, with homosexual attraction, their sexuality is their identity. It's almost identical to their identity. And that's a problem. That's a big problem. Even for Christians, our sexuality should not be our identity. I'm, I'm straight. You know, it shouldn't be this all-encompassing thing. Now, for some people it is, because sexuality is their God. But uh, um, the, the Lord is our God, not our sexuality. And our identity is in Christ. Uh, so, okay, so let me continue on here. Uh, he, so Phil asks, what do you think uh, Jesus would say or use a parable, uh, uh, say, on this topic? Uh, he writes, this person emphasizing Christians or the media posting Christians pouring out hate and negative connotations as opposed to what maybe Jesus might have said. So maybe Jesus would have been nicer, uh, <laughs> is, is your question. Here's the thing. Jesus was a devout Jew. And we need to recognize that in his social historical context. So, Jesus never talks about um, sexual orgies, okay? Now, one common line in pop culture is, well, Jesus never talked about this. Jesus never talked about transgenderism. Jesus never talked about homosexuality. Therefore, it must be okay, right? That's implied. Uh, that's also a, a problem because, of course, Jesus talked about many things which are clearly wrong. So, what would Jesus say? Well, Jesus, in this case, might point to uh, an Old Testament passage. Um, as it pertains to transgender, um, let me quickly look this up here. Uh, it's in the Old Testament uh, about uh, a man wearing a woman's clothing. It might be in Leviticus. Let's see here. Uh, Deuteronomy. It's in Deuteronomy uh, 22... Verse 5, I believe. Thanks for bearing with me here. Uh, it reads, Deuteronomy 22, 5. A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whatever does these things and it is an abomination to the Lord your God. So here's the concern. Well, clothes are just social constructs. What constitutes as this could be that. Here's the point, though. The point is that we have distinctive clothing. All right? So whether we want, you know, say if females wear ties, 
what man today were ties. If that evolves over time, well, these I think are the distinctive traits to the genders, and so the idea is that they wouldn't mix. Um, so I would say Jesus might point someone if Jesus were to be talking about transgenders, and he might point someone to Deuteronomy twenty-two five. Now here's let me let me go off and talk about something that um, a lot of pastors bring up. So there's the passage about the woman caught in adultery. And um, this passage, which is actually not in the earliest manuscripts, and nevertheless, a lot of evangelicals think it still is part of the canon, um, is about the woman caught in adultery, and Jesus does not throw a stone at her, right? He says, he who's without sin throw the first stone. Here's the problem. So the Pharisees came to trick him. And why were they tricking him? Because Levitican law, Mosaic law, required that when someone um, would be caught in adultery, that both of the adulterers would be brought forth to be stoned. So I think the reason why this is unique and why this is in the Bible, why it's a, a, a teaching that sticks out, is because even though the woman had sinned, she wasn't punished for it. And now, of course, Jesus says, go and sin no more. Why am I talking about this? The point is that Jesus, I think, had the other adulterer been included, I think he would have thrown, I, I think he would have uh, brought about the stoning or would have people do that. And I know this does not fit with a lot of uh, the um, perceptions that Americans have of Jesus, who's their homeboy and their buddy, who's cushy-cushy, teaches about love. This doesn't fit all that well. But it fits historically and accurately. What would a devout Jew do in that scenario? So this is all to say, um, you know, even though Jesus doesn't explicitly talk about some topics, what would have he believed? In order to answer that question, we need to go and study the backgrounds. What would a first century devout Jew believe and do? Uh, so Philip, I hope that answers your question uh, on that. Uh, thanks for that too. Okay, so I had another question here uh, from... Uh, Magic Monty, and uh, Magic Monty here uh, asks, why do Christians disagree so much given the fact that the spirit that abides in us guides us in all truth? I'll have to admit I struggle with this from time to time. All right, so this deals with a passage, this question, thanks Magic Monty, this question deals with a passage from John 16. All right, and uh, John 16, uh, we read here, um, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them, if I can quickly search for it here, um, Jesus is talking about the work of the Spirit. John 16, uh, 4b, I, I did not say these things to you from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me, and none of you asks me, where are you going? But because I have said these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin, because they do not believe. Concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father, and you will no longer, and you will see me no longer. Concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. Also, let me just quickly say, the ruler of the world is judged. So when Jesus returns to the Father, the ruler of the world Satan is judged. Interesting eschatological uh, point there. Uh, okay, verse 12. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. All right. This guiding into all truth, to uh, Magic Monty's question here. Uh, I believe this is a passage that is not presented to all Christians. It's presented to his disciples. Uh, and now, how do you especially know this? We'll continue reading on. Uh, verse 32, Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Guess what happened at the Garden of Gethsemane? They all scattered. Okay? So, Jesus is talking specifically to the twelve here. And uh, I think the claim that the uh, apostles had 
Christ's teaching is certainly true and can be backed up, say, through verses from the book of Acts, which talk about uh, the apostles' teaching and the truth that they had. So I think th this, the idea of the Spirit guiding us into all truth is not for all of these claims, uh, not for all of these Christians uh, for the present day. So I sort of have a restrictive view here on that. And now some, some might say, so I've had this conversation with some people. Some would say, well, uh, I, I've got a buddy who's Eastern Orthodox, and he says, well, look, uh, this is for all Christians, and um, and God, uh, the Father, the Holy Spirit, uh, the Holy Spirit is guiding His Church, right, the Eastern Orthodox Church, into all truth, right, because the Church can never be wrong. Of course, this is also begging the question: Why can't it just be all Christians, even people that say aren't part of the Eastern Orthodox Church? Uh, so, but simply put, I don't interpret this to be uh, referring to all Christians, just some of them. So, more simply, why do Christians disagree? Well, we have different uh, assumptions about a text. We have different backgrounds and different ways of interpreting. Some of us think well, think critically, think accurately. Some of us don't. <laughs> uh, and so we might end up coming to a different interpretation on some passage. So that's why some of us uh, disagree. I know just uh, a couple weeks ago, John MacArthur, um, Reformed pastor, called out N.T. Wright for um, uh, spouting heresy. You know, it's, it's like, it's, just, it's disappointing to me um, because I wish that there was a greater sense of um, ecumenism um, amongst Christians, uh, and, and you just don't get that, uh, which I think is sad. Okay, um, let me get along here to some other questions uh, before finishing up here. Um, okay, uh, Michael again asks, what are some books Kurt would recommend on faith, politics, and society? Um, I know I've already mentioned a few here uh, in today's show. I would say for economics, I would read, if you know nothing and haven't given any thought to economics before, check out Jay Richards' book, Money, Greed, and God, Why Capitalism is the Solution and Not the Problem. I think that's a great starter book for people on economics. Um, for um, books on theology, um, you know, it, it depends on how deep you want to get. Uh, if you're going, you know, the popular level, read stuff by C.S. Lewis. If you want to go deeper, if you want to get into, like, systematic theology, uh, Millard Erickson has a good um, book on that. Uh, I like, so let me say this, I like Wayne Grudem uh, and his style of accessible theology. He makes it easy to understand. I don't always agree with him on a number of points. Um, but, you know, he's written on a, on a wide variety of issues now. Uh, not just on, say, theology proper. Um, so he's very accessible as an author, and I think that's important for helping people without that background get into that. Um, so maybe, Michael, it all just depends on what you're seeking. You know, if you want books on the resurrection of Jesus, Mike Lacona is the guy to go to on that. Uh, he's been great on the resurrection argument. If you're looking for apologetic stuff, even more popular in general, like, say, on natural theology, J. Warner Wallace uh, strikes me as a as a good um, as a as a good author. Uh, Cold Case uh, Christianity. Michaela here says um, Alistair McGrath books. Yep, Alistair is good as well. Um, you know, check out numerous books. Um, he he's got some great stuff. I I loved his autobiography of C.S. Lewis. I know that's not sort of theology proper, but I really like that. Uh, not autobiography. His biography on C.S. Lewis. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's a lot of good authors out there, and if you, um, you know, I had a, a listener email me um, a while back uh, on a book for denominations, uh, how to learn more about denominations, and I had a recommendation for that listener. So if you've got, um, you know, a question on which area you want to learn more about, just send me a message. I'd be happy to sort of point you in a book that I enjoyed reading, and uh, or, or even if I haven't read, I've had heard good things about. Uh, Michael asks books on politics. How about John Locke's two treatises on government? <laughs> uh, I am a Lockean. Um, that's my political philosophy. Uh, that's probably going to be too heavy duty for people, though. Um, so that's a good question. There are a lot of good books out there, um, but where to start? Uh, I know this is going to kind of be simplistic. How about the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution? If you want to learn about American politics, I'm serious here. I read the, the U.S. Constitution. I mean, it just takes it just takes like an hour or two. Uh, it really doesn't take that long uh, to read it, and you begin to understand what it's about. Um, 
I liked a book uh, called uh, Founding Faith uh, by Stephen Waldman, which talks about the relationship between faith and politics as it pertains to the founders of America. Um, I think that would be a good starter book if you want to learn more about uh, faith issues uh, and how they related to the, the thought then. Um, if you um, want another um, idea here, uh, another short sit-down book, a sort of a book you can read in the afternoon, uh, and you can read it for free online. Uh, Frederick Bastiat's The Law is a good book on economics. Uh, it might be um, too, shall I say, proper because it's older uh, for, for people. If you're looking for something more in sort of common parlance, J. Richard's book would be good for that. Uh, but Bastiat's pretty good uh, on, on, on economics. Oh, he's great on economics. Um, uh, so I could get more into it. Um, and he explains uh, something called what today we call the broken window fallacy, um, which I saw in Paul Krugman, who is a liberal economist. Uh, Krugman thought, uh, uh, hey, how do we get out of the recession? Well, why don't we, um, you know, th there was a hurricane that was coming. And he said uh, something like, well, maybe that would be helpful for the economy because people have to spend their money. But that's called the broken window fallacy because uh, people could already spend their money on other things. So actually they're losing value when hurricanes and wars uh, and, and, and things like that happen. So Bastia is great for learning how uh, to respond to those things. Okay, um, I know I had a couple other questions to get to. Um, unfortunately, uh, I've already gone over uh, this week. Uh, so uh, thanks for those that have um, sat in here on the live uh, episode here and for who have uh, tuned in online. And if you still have more questions, I'd be happy to take those and we'll, we'll um, fill them out through the next couple weeks uh, at the end segments of, of each episode. Uh, so let me, let me say this. I want to thank you guys for, for being... Uh, whether you're a long-time listener or, or a, a new listener, thank you for tuning in. This is episode 52, uh, so we've been doing this for one year now. You know, we've got um, big hopeful ideas for the podcast, and uh, we hope that you'll be a part of joining our team of supporters. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, just go to our website, veracityhill.com, and click on the Patron tab. Patrons are folks that just chip in a few bucks a month, five, ten, twenty dollars a month, to help our podcast go. Uh, and also, if you're interested in sponsorship, uh, if you uh, want to uh, have an ad on our website or if you want to have an ad in the show, 30-second ad, uh, there are ways you can sponsor uh, the podcast as well. So uh, that does it for the show today. Um, again, thanks for, for listening in. And uh, let me also thank the sponsors. I don't have my sheet in front of me because I'm on location here at Crescent Lake Bible Camp. So let me see if I can do them off the top of my head. You've got Defenders Media, uh, Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, The Illinois Family Institute, Evolution 2.0, and uh, Ratio Christi. I hope I got them all there. Um, forgive me if I missed anyone there to our sponsors. Uh, thanks for all of your uh, continual support with that. And uh, finally, again, I want to thank you uh, for striving with me. Uh, to discover these deep truths that can be known for striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.